Kate. You slut. Who did? You did. Didn't. Did. I don't have to keep playing marbles. I can beat you without cheating. Well, why'd you edge up then? Who edged up? You did. Didn't. Did too. Pull it on Mickey and Walt. Didn't he edge up? You see, Walt says I didn't. And Mickey said you did. You're a cheater. Come on, let's fight it out. I don't want to fight. You're afraid, ain't he? Ain't afraid, just don't want to fight. Well, you will. What, you will? Come, Come on, on Al! Come on! Get him. Stop him, Al! Get him down! Get him, please! Come, Come on! on. What did you start at this? He did, didn't he? You come with me, Tommy. All right, sis. But I didn't cheat. And I didn't start the fight. Tommy, aren't you ashamed of yourself? Oh, Pat, don't you believe I started it? I was cheating. Honest, I wasn't. Only when he hit me first, I had to hit him back, didn't I? Whatever am I going to do with you? If you don't stop getting into mischief, I'll, I'll be ashamed to tell anyone you're my brother. Aw, oh, gee, Pat, I can't help it. Well, you just have to. Please promise you won't get into trouble anymore. All right. But you got to make how promise never to call me a cheat again. Pat! What is it, Flo? We's playing house over there, and we's having trouble with Salma's baby. I'll be right over and see what's the matter. Now, you get cleaned up and, and comb your hair and stay away from hell. This thing stay on. Well, here, let me show you. I did it just like the nurses do it in the nursery. Well, let me show you how to pull it. So you take it like this. See? Now you hand me the dolly. You hold it there. See? Hey, Tommy. Tommy, come here. What do you want? I got something I want to show you. What is it? It's a dog. A dog? Who's this? It? Ain't got no car or no license, so it must be nobody's. Where did you get him? He just sort of straight in here, and I didn't have to coax him much. What kind of a dog is it? I don't know. Just plain dog. Where would we keep him? I got that all figured out. You know the place near the garage where the gardener keeps his tools? Uh-huh. There's a lot of little rags in there. And we can make a place for him to sleep and everything. Yeah. Come on. Mm -hmm. Hey, what are they looking for the dog? Nah, that's just the people who are running the place. Come on, let's go. Good afternoon, friends. This is Walter White speaking bringing to you the initial program of Nobody's Children, direct from the reception room of the Children's Home Society. We want to thank the network, which so graciously offers its facilities to introduce homeless children into childless homes. The great purpose of Nobody's Children is to make them somebody's children. For the first time in its history, radio is being used to take you into the privacy of a children's home to introduce you to the little ones and hear their intimate stories. During the brief case histories, the children will not be in the broadcasting room. The first youngster to be interviewed today is a bright-eyed lad with dark hair and a mischievous smile. His name is Vincent. We'll have you meet him. Hello, Vincent. Hello, Mr. White. Will you climb right up here on this bench? There we are. How old are you, Vincent? I'm five going on six. Five going on six. My, you're quite a big boy for your age, aren't you? Yes, sir, and I'm getting bigger all the time. And pretty soon I'll be all grown up. What do you hope to be when you grow up? A policeman. Why do you want to be a policeman? So I can find lost kids like the policeman that found me when I got lost. Well, that's a very fine thought. And we here at the home know that you'll make a great policeman. But 
You must have other ambitions. Fred? <laughs> well, wouldn't you like to be something else? Yes, sir. I'd like to be a soldier, too, but I guess a fella can't be both. <laughs> well, perhaps you can. You might be a part-time policeman and then also be a soldier. Well, I guess that'll be about all for now, Vincent. Goodbye. Bye, Mr. White. And the best in life to you. He's a fine lad, with a full life before him, qualified in every way to make a useful citizen. And yet at the moment, he's one of the legion of nobody's children. The next case is Peggy. Her father, a Norwegian of noble birth, was lost at sea. This came as a heavy blow because the family finances were soon depleted. The mother pitched in with redoubled vigor to keep a roof over their heads and literally worked herself to death. She contracted an illness about a year ago and died shortly thereafter. There were no relations living, so in such cases, the public authorities assisted on a temporary basis. Later, Peggy was brought here to the Children's Home Society. Peggy is rather small for her age, and her front teeth are missing. To Peggy, the loss of her front teeth is quite a calamity. She's quite sensitive about it. I'll have you meet her. Hello, Peggy. How are you today? I'm fine, thank you, Mr. White. Oh, come, come now, dear. Open your mouth so that everybody listening can hear you. But I don't want them to see me on account of I ain't got my front teeth. But they can't see you, dear. Are you sure they can't? I'm positive. All right, then. Uh, uh, Peggy, how old are you? Six. I understand that you're quite the little dressmaker. I make all the dresses for my dollies. You do? Do you like sewing? Yes, and cooking and baking, too. Really? Mrs. Martin, the cook, is learning me how. Learning you? Excuse me, she's teaching me, so when I grow up, I'll know how to bake and cook everything. Some spinach, because I don't like spinach, even if it is good for me. Well, that's all right, and you're a very fine little girl. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mr. White. Our next case is eight-year-old Carol, whose parents were passengers on a liner which met with a disaster several years ago. Her mother and father perished when the liner went down. Carol, then only an infant and one of the few survivors, was brought here to the home. Carol shows great promise of becoming an excellent pianist. And now I wish to introduce her to you. Hello, Carol. Hello, Mr. White. Will you step up here, please? My, you're... you're quite a big girl. Yes, sir. How long have you been playing the piano? Ever since I was a little girl. How little? Oh, oh, very little. Did you have a teacher? No. Well, then how is it that you play the piano so well? I don't know. I just play. Do you read music? No, sir. Whenever I hear music, I just sit down and play. Will you stick to that music, dear? And I'm sure it'll make you very, very happy. I wish we had television, friends, that you could see this radiant little Carol. That'll be all for this time, dear. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. White. Goodbye. Goodbye. Mommy, if ever you get me a little sister, get me one like that. Now I'm honored to present a gentleman whose unceasing efforts to promote the welfare of our youth needs no mention here. We are indeed grateful to have with us today Senator Lawrence Hargraves. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. White, for the invitation to attend this broadcast. I want to compliment you and the home for the noble work that you're doing in your efforts to find homes for these homeless children. As I sat here watching this broadcast, listened to you talk with these youngsters, I couldn't help but feel that it's the duty of every childless home that's in a position to adopt a child to seriously consider doing so to give them the affection of parents that they need so much during the formative years. We owe it as much to ourselves as we do to these orphan youngsters to find them good homes, to make it possible that they have the advantage that they will otherwise be denied. There is no substitute 
for father mother love these homeless youngsters should be fitted for the responsibilities that are to come just as much as the youngsters who are blessed with homes and loving parents we cannot and should not deny them a place in the world or the gift of a fuller useful happier life in parting I trust and pray that these youngsters to whom you refer as nobody's children will soon be somebody's children. I thank you. Thank you, Senator Hargraves. And now we bring this broadcast of Nobody's Children to a close, hoping you will be with us again next week at this same time. Please give thought during the week to the dependent children whose lives could be filled with hope and joy by a little more gentleness and kindness from the rest of us. This is Walter White, who is most grateful to you for your contribution in listening. Thank you, and goodbye, friends. Pat, someday will you make me a bow like that? Sure, I will, dear. Piggy, aren't you dressed yet? I don't know what's the matter, Pat. Maybe I'm too big for this dress. Or maybe it's too small for me. Turn around. I'll help you. There we are. Now remember, Peggy, when you talk to your visitors, be very polite. Don't say, yeah. And if it's a lady, say, yes, ma'am. And if it's a gentleman, say, yes, sir. Understand? Yeah, I mean, yes, ma'am. And if a gentleman is with her, I say, yes, sir. And if a lady is there, I say, yes, ma'am. There. Thank you, Pat. Eating. I'm chewing. Chewing what? Gum. Oh, but you mustn't. Maybe they won't like a girl without teeth, so I'm going to fill the spaces up with gum. See? Your visitors are here, Peggy. Are you ready? Come on, dear. Peggy, what is the matter with you? You're embarrassing me. Can't you talk? Yes, sir. Well, why don't you? I counted my teeth out, and I fixed them up with chewing gum, and Miss Jameson made me take it out, see? <laughs> <laughs> That's nothing to be ashamed of. All little girls lose their first teeth. You'll soon get other teeth. You're a very pretty girl. Even without my teeth? Mm -hmm. Would you care to look around the hall? We'd love to. Peggy, will you show Mr. and Mrs. Ferber around? Can I show my flowers and vegetables? Of course you may. Do you grow flowers and vegetables here? Yeah, I mean, yes, sir. We can tear a patch and grow flowers and all kinds of vegetables, except in spinach. <laughs> <laughs> You'll find Peggy an excellent guy. I'm sure we will. Hey, sis. Sis. Pat, come in, Tony. What's the matter? Well, you remember that dog that strayed in here a couple of weeks ago? Haven't you got rid of that dog yet? Oh, I told you I was going to get rid of him, didn't I? Well, did you? Well, will you wait till I tell you what happened? All right, what happened? Well, you remember that dog that strayed in here a couple of weeks ago? You know, Jimmy and me hid in the garage so nobody would know that we got him? Yes. Well, we was going to let him go this morning. And what do you think happened? What happened? Well, we were going to give him his breakfast this morning, and what do you think? He wasn't there. Oh, wasn't he? That's what you think. He was there, all right, and there were six pups with him. Tommy, you march yourself right down to Mrs. Marshall and tell her about it. You've been punished twice already in the past two weeks. Yeah, for something I didn't do. What did I have to do with these puppies? I always get double-crossed. Tommy, you tell Mrs. Marshall. All right, sis, I'll tell her. Look at Pat. I'll take the blame for keeping that stray dog here, but they can't blame them puppies on me. Excuse me. What's 
the matter with Tommy? Oh, he and Jimmy kept a stray dog in the garage, and this morning they found six pups. <laughs> I told him to tell Mrs. Marshall about it. Tommy's a real boy, all oh, right. Oh, Jameson. Yes? About Peggy and Carol. Is everything all right? I think so, dear. Their visitors were very much impressed with them. Oh, I'm so glad. See, it worked. It's going to work for you and Tommy, too. We've crossed our fingers so many times, Tommy and me. But... Remember, Pat, faith and hope. There's a place for everyone. Sometimes it takes a little longer. Oh, I wasn't thinking about myself. Honest, I wasn't. It's Tommy. I wish we could find a place for him. There's a place for both of you. I just know there is. Miss Jameson. Yes? There's to be a board meeting, and Mrs. Marshall wants you to take care of the front office. I'll be there in just a moment. Next time, we'll glue them. I feel there should be some discussion in the case of Pat. We know we're faced with a serious problem regarding this unfortunate girl, and yet, what is there we can do about it? It's a pity we've been unable to find a home for her. It's even a greater pity that a child of her age seems to be a drudge in the world. Yet we must make room for other children. We have no alternative other than to place her in the state institution for handicapped children. Have you any thoughts on the matter, Mrs. King? I don't see what else we can do under the circumstances. Mr. Rogers. Yes, Mr. White. I have a thought that while it wouldn't change the condition of sending Pat to an institution, it might ease her burden. What would you suggest? I would like very much to place her brother Tommy on tomorrow's broadcast in the hope of finding a home for him. Oh, I realize you don't approve of separating brother and sister, but in this case, I think it best. A home might be found that would allow Tommy and Pat to keep in touch with each other. I think Mr. White's idea is very good. If the boy should be placed, well, it would help matters. I don't see why it shouldn't be done. If it's agreeable to the board, we can wait until the boy is taken care of. Very well, then. That's what we'll do. Pat, I don't want to go on the radio. I don't want to leave here unless you come with me. All right, Tommy, come along. Oh, gee, Pat, I don't want to go. Go on, Tommy, and answer all Mr. White's questions like a good boy. Okay. Hello, Pat. Are you busy? Not very. Tommy's going on the broadcast now. Yes, I know. Too bad about the rule that we can't watch the broadcast, isn't it? No, there's a very good reason for that rule. But there's no rule against hearing it, is there? Well, I, I think there is. Then I can't listen to him? I'm afraid you can't, dear. Of course, if I'm out of the room and you should happen to turn on the radio, there's nothing I could do about it. And now I want you to meet Tommy. Hello, Tommy. How do you do, sir? Won't you get right up here on this bench? Thank you, sir. How are you, Tommy? Just fine, thank you, Mr. White. How old are you? Nine. What do you hope to be when you grow up? An aviator. Oh, interested in mechanics? Yes, sir. And I guess I'd like to be a speedboat racer, too. Well, that's fine. Have you any other interests? Yes, sir. My sister, Pat. We've always been together, and I don't want to be separated from her. I'd rather die than be away from her. We all know the devotion between you and Pat and... And we're always going to be like that. We wouldn't want you to be any other way. And I'm not going to be. She gives me the dickens sometimes. But just the same, she's swell. And I don't want to leave her. And I won't. And I'm going to work and, and take care of her when I grow up. And make money so I can buy her nice things. Like an automobile. And everything to make her happy. Well, of course you are. 
Thank you so much for coming in. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mr. White. And the best of luck to you. Thank you, sir. John, how long is it since we sent our application into the home? It's been quite some time. I'd like to go to see those two children. All right, Alice. We'll go down the first thing in the morning. <laughs> yes, right away, please. They'll both be here in just a moment. We kind of like the idea of adopting a brother and sister. It sort of rounds out the family. We always figured that a single child might get lonesome. That's very true. We like the way that little fellow talked on the radio. Say, he must be a real boy. He is indeed. We're very proud of Tommy. And the boy's sister, we didn't hear her. Uh, no. She wasn't on the program. We've been thinking about adopting a youngster for some time, as you know. Yes. Come in. Uh, Pat and Tommy, this is Mr. and Mrs. Stone. Hello. Hello. Oh. So this is the little man. Glad to meet you, son. Uh, this is my sister, Pat. How do you do? How do you do? Uh, how old are you, dear? Thirteen, and she's well. Thirteen? Uh, quite a young lady. You may run along now, children. Mr. and Mrs. Stone just wanted to say hello. Goodbye, sir. And ma'am. Goodbye. 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 They're two of the finest children we have in the home. Keen intelligence, excellent characters, everything that one could hope for in growing children. But we, we had no idea that... How long has she been that way? Ever since she came here, about nine years ago. It's too bad. Uh, well, frankly, we didn't have in mind a child of 13. You see, a girl that age is pretty well grown. Her character formed, her ways set. Uh, you know what I mean. Yes. I believe I do, Mr. Stone. Of course, we'd like to take the little fellow. John, perhaps the children wouldn't want to be separated. The boy said so on the radio. Of course, we'd rather not separate them. But the important thing is to find good homes for these children. Pat and Tommy are old enough to understand. We'll give the boy a good home. Very well, Mr. Stone. I'll take the matter up with the placement committee and let you know as soon as possible. And thank you so much. Thank you. We'll be waiting to hear from you. Goodbye. 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 Well, it looks as if we'd found a place for Tommy. They're very fine people who were thoroughly investigated by us some time ago. And Pat? What are you doing indoors? It's so beautiful out. I didn't care to go out. Besides, I'm, I'm waiting for Tommy. He's coming to say goodbye. Pat. You're not going to let him see you crying, are you? I won't. Crying won't help matters. Come now. Chin up. It'll make it so much easier for Tommy. I'll try. I just hope Tommy will be happy in his new home. Of course he'll be happy. And you should be too. That Tommy's going to have a nice home. Father and a mother. That's what you want for him, isn't it? Oh, yes, I, I do. That must be him. Chin up, Pat. That's better. Come in. Ready, Tommy. Oh, I don't want to go. I don't want no father, no mother, no neither. I want to stay here with you. You must 
back like that, Tommy. I don't care. I don't want to go. I'm going to stay here and take care of you. Please, Tommy, aren't you ashamed of yourself? You're almost a, a grown-up man, and you're acting like a baby. It's only that I... You were the one that was going to be such a big brother. But you can't do that by staying here and pushing me around in this old wheelchair. I don't want that kind of a brother. I, I want one that can go out and be somebody big so I can be proud of him. Just think, you're going to have a real home, a real mother and father. You'll be able to go to a nice school and study aviation and someday maybe be a, a big aviator. Then I'll be able to say, see, that's my brother Tommy. I'm so proud of him. But bad. Are you ready, Tommy? He'll be there in a minute. Now remember, be a good, be a good boy and, and make them love you just as if you, you were their very own. Oh, wait, Dad. I'll cry. And make them just as proud of you as, as I am. Well, I guess you'd better hurry. Goodbye, Tommy. Like that. Come and see me often. Sure, Pat. But I promise I'll write every single day. You won't forget to write to me every day, Pat. I won't. I promise, Tommy. When was this decision made? Last week at the board meeting, right after Tommy was placed. Do you realize what it will do to Pat to send her to such an institution? Being confined with helpless incurables will crush her faith and spirit, destroy every bit of hope she has. It's like condemning her to death. Oh, it isn't as bad as all that. I feel as you do about it. But what else is there to be done? The case has been discussed several times. But Pat is an asset to the home. She's more than worth her keep. And she's a good influence on the children. Helping them with their little problems. I agree with everything you say. However, arrangements have been made to send her to the state institution next week. I leave it to you to break the news to her. Do you want to see me, Miss Jameson? Yes, Pat. I'll be with you in a moment. Have you heard from Tommy? I got a letter from him this morning. How is he? Well, you know Tommy. Most of his letters was about me. But he'll get used to that. At least I hope so. He's a boy and he has to make his way in the world. As for me, I don't matter much. I'm, I'm happy and contented here. I don't blame Mr. and Mrs. Stone for not wanting me when they saw me. I realize I'd only be a burden. So I'll just stay along here with you, and maybe when I get older, I can be taught nursing, then I can Come, Pat. Mrs. Marshall wants to speak to you. Be back in just a minute. Pat's in the reception room. I can't tell her, Helen. I'd rather quit. I know it sounds stupid, but I haven't the heart. 
You're acting like a child. I can't help it. You'll have to figure some other way to break the news to her. How do you do? How do you do? Do you wish to see Miss Marshall? Yes, we have an appointment. She's busy now, but I'll call her. Never mind. We'll wait, thank you. Oh, uh, won't you sit down? Thank you. If you'd like to read. What's your name? Patricia. But everybody calls me Pat. That's a lovely name. Have you been here very long? Yes, sir. Ever since I was four years old. And how old are you now? Thirteen. Have you any brothers or sisters? Yes, I have a brother. He's nine years old. Is he here? Well, he was up until last week. He's been adopted. Don't you mind being separated? No, ma'am. Of course, I, I do miss him. But then you see, it's best for him. He's so ambitious. He always says that when he grows up, he's going to take care of me. And he will, too. Oh, Miss Jameson, these people are waiting to see Mrs. Marshall. I'm John Miller, and this is Mrs. Miller. How do you do? How do you do? I'm sorry to have kept you waiting. No, we didn't mind. We had a very delightful little talk with Pat. Darling, wait for me in the dormitory. All right. I'm awfully glad to have met you. It was a pleasure. Goodbye. Goodbye. You may come right in. Mr. and Mrs. Miller to see you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Won't you be seated? Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Excuse me just a moment. You were interested in a girl of three? Yes. Mrs. Marshall, I'd like some information about Patricia, the little girl we just spoke to in the other room. Patricia? Oh, surely. According to our record, she was born a normal, healthy baby, but became afflicted when she was two years of age. Her mother passed on after the birth of her next child, a boy. Her father passed on shortly after, grief-stricken. Patricia's a very fine child, but because of her infirmity, it's been a problem to place her. Very few people realize the emptiness in the heart of a child that is so afflicted. I assure you I do, Mrs. Marshall. You see, when I was a child, I had a similar misfortune. Do you know whether or not she's incurable? We don't know. The doctors felt that until Pat was 13, it wasn't wise to try anything. She's leaving for the state institution for handicapped children next week. State institution? Yes. If you don't mind, we'd like to adopt her. I feel we can provide proper medical care, and if she can be cured, we'll spare no effort. We're very grateful to you. Patricia's a very dear child. I'll call a special meeting of the placement committee for the consideration of your request and let you know immediately. And thank you for your kindness. I'm sure you'll make Patricia very happy. We'll do everything we can for her. Goodbye. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Goodbye. 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 Jamie. Jamie. Yeah? Pat's been adopted. Why, I, I just can't believe it. It's wonderful. What? You'll tell her. Uh-uh. No, you won't. I'll tell her. What is it? I have some news for you. About Tommy? No. About you. About me? What is it? You're going to leave here. Where am I going? Mr. and Mrs. Miller, the lady and gentleman you were talking to in the reception room, want to adopt you. They're lovely people, and I know you'll be happy. Oh, Pat, I'm so happy for you. Well, here we are, Mary. There you are, Pat. We're home. And this is Mary. A very fine lady, but kind of talks too much. Oh, go on with you, Mr. Miller. Don't you be spoiling the child already. And Pat, this is Lassie. Lassie? Hello, Lassie. Say hello to your new mistress. So pretty. 
Gee, this is, this is like a dream. I hope I don't wake up suddenly and find this really a dream. If it's a dream, dear, it's going to be a permanent one. Wouldn't you be wanting some lunch? Yes, Mary, and serve it on the lawn. It'll be ready in a jiffy. Say, I'd better be running along. I can't let my daughter make me neglect my business. See you later, Pat. Bye, Dad. Goodbye, Dad. Goodbye, Dad. Goodbye, John. And don't forget to stop at the dress shop. I won't. And no loud coat. <laughs> All right. Martin, will you please take Miss Pat's things out of the car and put them in her room? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And now I'll show you around your new home. Come on, Leslie. You put the home in a very bad light, breaking windows and fighting with the neighbor's children. We didn't expect that of you. Tommy, do you realize what it means to be sent back to the home for being an incorrigible? Huh? Uh, I mean, yes, ma'am. Now can I speak to Pat? Why did you do these things? I don't know. Do you think anyone's going to be kind to you and give you a good home if you act like a rowdy? Yes, ma'am. Please, now can I speak to Pat? Didn't you like Mr. and Mrs. Stone? Yes, ma'am. Didn't they treat you all right? Yes, ma'am. Then why did you misbehave the way you did? Because I just did, that's all. And now can I speak to Pat? Better take him to his room. Come, Tommy. Goodbye, Mrs. Marshall. Miss Jameson, I'd like to talk to Pat. She isn't here. Not here? What do you mean? What happened to her? Where is she? Pat's been adopted into a fine home. Do you know who she is? Yes, I do. She's with very nice people. Can I write to her? Can I? Not just now. But she'll worry. She'll want to know what happened to me. Well, again, I haven't written to her for a week already. Please let me write to her. Now listen, Tommy. Pat's only been with her new parents a short time. And if she finds out you've been sent back here because you were a bad boy, it will make her very unhappy. Yeah, I, I guess it would at that. Now, when I think it's time, I'll let you write her. And perhaps later on you can visit her. No fooling? No fooling. Now, come on. Aren't you feeling well? Oh, I feel fine, Dad. I think I'll have to scold Mary. Why? Well, she evidently doesn't prepare food to your liking. Something on your mind, Pat? It's nothing. Honest, it isn't. Remember our little pact? We're to keep nothing from you, and you're to keep nothing from us. We agreed, you know, to be three pals. It's nothing. Really, Dad. Aren't you happy here? Oh, of course I am. Please don't think I'm not. It's only that... Only what? Well, I'm worried about Tommy. Is there something wrong with him? I don't know. I haven't heard from him in over a week. I phoned Miss Jameson this morning and she said he was back at the home. Back at the home? Yes, he's... he's been bad. Did some things that his new parents didn't like, so they sent him back. I just can't understand what could have happened to him. He's always such a good boy. Never did anything really wrong. I don't believe you have any reason to worry. You know where he is. May I write to him? Why, of course, dear. Hello, Pat. Hello. Did you have a nice afternoon? Had a wonderful time. The weather's a bit zippy, but indeed it was wonderful. Was it too cold for you? No. I like it when it's a bit zippy. -o. There you go. Making fun of me again. Well, I wasn't making fun of you, Mary. Oh, go on and do it. I like it. How would you like a bit of hot milk, darling, with some cookies? You know, the ones with the raisins in them you like so much. All right. Hello, everybody. Hello, John. Hello, Dad. Getting ready to go out? No, we, we just got back. From where? The park. Have a good time? Yes. You know, there was some children skipping rope, and I held one end of the rope and, and turned it for them. Is that so? Well, young lady, pretty soon you won't have to hold the rope for other children to skip. You'll be the one that'll do the skipping. 
I hope so. No hoping about it. I know you will. There's a famous European specialist in town, Dr. Giro. Our family physician, Dr. Tovar. You, uh, you met him, Pat. Yes, I did. Well, he made an appointment with Dr. Giro for me. I just came from the hospital, and he's going to fix you up so you'll be able to walk, run, skip rope, and even dance. But, John, you didn't tell me anything about it. I always told you a good businessman never speaks about a deal until it's concluded. When will he see Pat? We're taking Pat to the hospital in the morning. Do I have to go to a hospital? Yes, dear. Will he have to operate? You're not afraid. No, but... Mother was operated on when she was little, girl. There isn't anything to worry about. Well, all right. Whatever you say. Well, Mary, shall we... Shall we go and get the milk and cookies? You know, the ones with the raisins that I like so much? All right, darling. We'll see you later. There you are, darling. All fixed for the night. Good night. Sleep tight. And everything in this bed is so clean, there's no fear of a bite. <laughs> you know, my mother used to say that to me when I was a little tot. Only she used to say, what night bite? I found out since that wasn't that as a fight. Good night, Mary, and thanks a lot for being so kind. Oh, go on with you. I'm not kind at all. I'm, I'm just a blathering old lady. I think you're swell. You're mighty swell yourself, darling. Mary. Yes, dear. Don't go yet. Sit down. What is it, Ted? Have you ever had an operation? Me? With never a sick day in my life? I should say not. No. Whenever I had an ache or a pain, I, I found out that a little prayer was as good as any medicine. The most it ever cost me was 10 or 15 cents in the collection basket on a Sunday. Oh, I ain't saying doctors ain't no good, but my doctor's the greatest. He is? Indeed he is. When you think of a man who had an infirmity for 38 years, and by the doctor only saying, take up thy bed and walk, the man took up his bed and walked. And do you know why? Because he had faith. And for all of those that had faith, he healed. The dumb spoke, the blind saw, and the deaf heard. Because they had faith. And after they were healed, they didn't get a bill that made them sick all over again. Now listen, darling. You go right ahead and see this European doctor. Let him do all he can for you. And in the meantime, I'll be talking to my doctor about you. Just the same as I've been doing every night since you first came here. Good night, darling. Good night, Mary. Sleep tight. I will. Yes, Pat. Is Dr. Devar going to be with me all the time? Of course he is, dear. I'll be with you every moment. I just wanted to know. Don't be afraid, Pat. I'm not afraid, Mother. We'll stay right here and wait for you, pal. Okay, pal. Well, Pat, we'd better go in. Dr. Garot's waiting for us. All right, Doctor. It's been over 
two hours. We should have some word soon. was not successful. You mean the... Oh, no. Nothing like that. The little girl will live, but she'll spend the rest of her life a bedridden invalid. Everything possible was done for her child. Thank you very much. Was it successful? The usual hospital answer, doing as well as can be expected. But you may visit her. When? Anytime. I'd like to take Tommy with me. All right, go ahead and give her my love. I will, Helen. And tell her I run in to see her the first chance I get. All right. Tommy, come in and get cleaned up. What for? Where are we going? I'm going to take you to the hospital to see Pat. Is she all right? Will she be able to walk? Don't ask so many questions. Hurry and get dressed. Well, I gee, I'll be ready right away. Hey, fellas, hey, kid, I'm going to see Pat. Hey, Miss Jameson's hey. going to take me to see Pat. She's going to be all well, walk and everything. Gee, I knew she'd get well. How'd you know? Because ever since Pat went away from here, every night when I said my prayers, I kept my fingers crossed, just like she used to do. Gee. Well, I guess I better hurry. Gee, ain't it swell, Pat? You're going to be all well. Look at everything. Oh, boy, am I glad to see you. How's your new home? Are the people good to you? And who wheels you around? Or do you have to do it yourself? Tommy. Don't ask so many questions at one time. You'll wear Pat out. He won't. I feel fine. But there's a few questions I want to ask you. That's what I was afraid of. What you're going to ask me is why I was sent back to the home. Guilty conscience, huh? Why were you such a bad boy? Gee, Pat, I couldn't help it. Honest, I couldn't. Mr. and Mrs. Stone was nice to me and all like that, but I was lonesome for you. I tried to want to stay there, but, but it just didn't work, that's all. And when I got back to the home and found you weren't there, did I double-cross myself? Look at that. Let's skip it. All right, Tommy. We'll skip it. Gee, Pat, you're so well. Oops, most forgot. Both some presents the kids sent you. They ain't so hot, but, but they're presents. This is from Marion. It looks like it needs an operation, too. And uh, these are from Selma. Gosh, I guess I must have sat on them too much. And this is from Junie. She says she prayed with it every night for you and, and kept her fingers crossed. Well, that's all our presents, except the piece of candy that uh, started to melt and I ate it on the way up here. Anyhow, the, the kids were asking for it and they want you to hurry up and get well so you can come and see them. Sorry, but visiting hours are over. Come, Tommy. We must go now. Can't we stay here? No, Pat must have her rest. She's resting. She ain't doing nothing. I know, but visitors are only allowed a little time. Can't I stay here, Pat? You can come and see me again. Can I? Mm -hmm. Of course you can, dear. Goodbye. Goodbye. Be a good boy, Tommy. I will, and I never want to double-cross myself again. Give my love to Miss Spalding and Miss Marshall and... And Mr. White and all the little kids. I will. Goodbye, dear. Bye. We'll see you soon. For them. All right. Bye, Pat. Bye.
going, Ray. Going? Good morning to you, Tim. Yeah, you're going on a picnic, eh? Ah, it is a sad picnic it is, Tim. I'm taking over a little snack to part at the hospital. Oh, by the way, Mary, how is she? Oh, the operation didn't turn out so good. That's too bad. It wasn't bad enough to go around in a wheelchair. Now she's to spend the rest of her days lying in bed. Oh, uh, would you like me to give you a lift over to the hospital with a basket? No, Tim, the chauffeur's driving me. Uh, on the way over, stop at the store. I'll have some flowers ready for you to take to her. Oh, thanks, Tim, I will. And tell her I was asking for her, will you? I'll do that. But it's only a snack I'm bringing for the child. Well, there's everything in there she likes. I know, but it's against the hospital rules to bring foodstuffs to the patients. You see, their diets are prepared for them. But Pat doesn't have to be in a diet. Why, she hasn't any too much flesh in her bones, even as it is. You know, my mother always said the sick should be fed up. I assure you, madam, if you leave the basket here, her nurses will see she gets some from time to time. But what about the chickens? They won't last from time to time. I'm sorry, madam. Those are the hospital rules. All right. Can I take up the flowers? Yes, you may. It's room 603. So then she says to Mrs. Shea, you can't bring anything into the room. The diets are prepared for the patients. So I had to leave it downstairs. The nurses will give it to her from time to time. And don't you be letting those nurses get away with anything, especially the roast chickens. I fix them just the way you like them. All right, Mary. Thanks so much for bringing them. Oh, aren't they pretty? You know, Tim's a fine man. He was sending you flowers all the time you're here. You don't have to pay for them, you know. I suppose he and the man who has the flower stand down at the market have a, a sort of a barter system. How's Lassie? Just fine. And a shame is you. Why, at the very mention of your name, she barks. I don't suppose I could bring her up to see you, hmm? No. Sure, if they have a row about bringing food into the place, they'd pick up an awful row about a dog. <laughs> Where did you get this? One of the girls from the home sent it to me. Why, there's enough medicine in this little book to cure all her fleas. Don't you be believing one word those European specialists say about you going to be helpless, never able to get out of bed again. <laughs> Just you read this book, darling, and, and you have faith and you'll get well. Hello, Pat. Hello, Mary. Hello, Pat. Oh, I was just leaving. Well, goodbye, darling, and, and I'll be back real soon. Goodbye. Have something nice for you, Pat. Picked them out all by myself. John, it's easy to see you pick those out. Sometimes I think you're colorblind. Aren't they nice? I think they're lovely, Dad. How are you feeling, Pat? All right, I guess. All right. All right, what? Mother. Dad, you remember our pack, don't you? Of course we do. We'd never keep anything from each other. You know, like pals. That's right. But tell me the truth. About me, I mean. I don't understand. Is it true that I'm going to be helpless and have to stay in bed and never be able to get out? told you such a thing? Why, only this morning we were talking to Dr. Giro and, and he said you were getting along fine. You'll be up and around in no time. I planned some lovely things for you, Pat. A nice long vacation at the seashore. We'll have loads of fun. I'll teach you how to swim. Would you like that? Yes, Dad. It'd be swell to be able to swim. I'm sorry, but she must have her dinner now. Well, Pat, I'll see you tomorrow. Bye, Dad. Goodbye, thank you. Hi, Mother. I'll change these for you. Get you a nice pink pair, that's your color. 
Is there anything we can bring you tomorrow? No, thanks. Goodbye, dear. Bye. I don't want anything to eat. No, you must eat something. No, really, I, I can't. I, I don't want to. Come, come, dear. Would you like to leave the light and the little radio on for a while? Please. Well, then just push the button when you get sleepy and I'll come in and turn it off. Good night. Good night. There's enough medicine in this little book to cure all earthly ills. Would you please lie down on the couch in the waiting room? No, John, I'll wait. going to be all right. So, she'll be able to walk? Yes, but it'll take a little time. The fall caused a dislocation of a vertebrae. In operating, we found a tumor on the spinal cord, which we removed. Oh, I could go into any number of medical terms which would be hard for you to understand. But in plain language, she's going to be all right. I want you both to go home and get a good rest. I'll let you know when you can come and see her. I don't know what to say, Jim. Just go home and rest, both of you. Goodbye, Jim. Goodbye, John. And now, friends, it is with a hearty welcome that I introduce our guest on today's broadcast. Until a short time ago, she was one of nobody's children, a crippled girl of 13 who has had the good fortune to be adopted by a kindly couple and who is now somebody's child. I can't find adequate words of gratitude for her new parents who have given her her rightful place in the world. So I'll have her speak for herself. Right over here, please. Friends, our little guest, Miss Patricia Miller, whom we fondly call Pat. Well, Pat, there's no need of my telling you how happy we at the home are to see you walk in here. Tell our radio listeners how you feel about it. 
Well, all I can say is that I'm the happiest girl in the world, and I'm so grateful to Mother and Dad Miller. And I'd like to say to everybody who's depressed and feel that all hope is gone, to just have faith. Now, Mr. White, I have a surprise for you. Surprise? Mm-hmm. Tommy, come here. Mother and Dad are going to adopt Tommy, and, and instead of us being three pals, we're, we're going to be four. Well, what do you think about that, Tommy? Oh, I think it's pretty swell, Mr. White. Well, Pat, this is indeed a pleasant surprise. And needless for me to tell you that we wish you and Tommy and your mother and dad everything that is good. Thanks for coming. And be sure to visit us often. I know the staff at the home and the children will always be happy to see you. Thank you, Mr. White. We will. Oh, well, goodbye, Mr. White. Goodbye. 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 Now we bring the 53rd broadcast of Nobody's Children to a close, hoping you will be with us again next week at this same time. This is Walter White, who is most grateful to you for your contribution in listening. Thank you, and goodbye, friends. Thank you.